everyone get questions. Yeah. Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Tuesday morning of uh, virtual cardiovascular grand rounds. Um, as we speak, I think our hope is that soon in the next few weeks, uh, we can start the transition at least to a hybrid model, um, given or based on what the COVID numbers are doing. But having said that, uh, we all know the uh, house rules. Uh, we'll try to take questions at the end of the talk. Uh, feel free to put questions in the chat or raise your hands um, uh, to be called on to ask questions. So without further ado, I'll ask uh, Dr. Erica Spatz uh, to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Erica. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Blaha to today's uh, Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Dr. Blaha is an Associate Professor of Cardiology and Epidemiology and serves as the Director of Clinical Research for the Johns Hopkins Sicarone Center for Prevention at, um, at Hopkins. He is really a true leader in the field of preventive cardiology, uh, transforming our approach to the detection of subclinical atherosclerotic disease, specifically using CT, coronary artery calcium scores, and really giving us the clinical tools to discriminate people who are at low risk, who don't need statins or high intensity preventative therapy from people who are at high risk. I know he's transformed the way that I approach patients and has been a clear leader in the field. He's a prolific researcher in this area. And if you review his papers, I promise you, it'll teach you everything you need to know about um, preventive cardiology. Um, something I did not know is Dr. Blaha represents the fourth generation of physicians in his family. Um, he went to uh, uh, Notre Dame for undergrad and then on to Vanderbilt um, uh, to earn his medical degree and then came to uh, Hopkins for his uh, residency in cardiology training as well as a degree in um, epidemiology at the School of Public Health. Uh, he is a um, editor of, on multiple journals and serves on different committees at the FDA and AHA and has really just um, been a real guiding force in preventive cardiology. So let me just turn it over to Dr. Blaha. We're excited to have you here today and really looking forward to your talk. It's absolutely my pleasure to be here and thank you for that kind introduction. And what I, what I hope to do today is to give a very clinically focused talk. So I'm gonna talk a lot about research and my research even, but I really hope that it'll be something that you can take and actually change the way you practice. Um, for all the folks out here who see patients, you're gonna see patients like the ones I'm describing in, in, in the talk today. And as you heard, so my, my field is at the junction of preventive cardiology and imaging. And I think really going forward, those two fields are gonna come together even more. Imaging, particularly of subclinical atherosclerosis is a central part of preventive cardiology nowadays as we expand the, the kind of the idea of what preventive cardiology is. So I hope to kind of convince you, number one, about the importance of imaging and preventive cardiology. Then I hope to also make an impact on practice. So let me share my slides and I'll try to go to full screen and make sure that you all can see the slides. And here's the title of my talk, Coronary Artery Calcium Finally Endorsed in Major Guidelines, an Early 2022 Update. So what do I hope to do in the, in the first quarter of this lecture, I hope to, to fill you in on kind of what we already know about calcium scoring and where it sits in the guidelines. Then I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about new concepts. Uh, this is really in response to all the questions we get about how do we use this tool in clinical practice and all the research that's come out that it's informed all those questions. So I hope the remainder of the talk will be almost all new for you, especially if you're not in the field of preventive cardiology. Now, in the spirit of the Johns Hopkins Grand Rounds, I wanna start with the case. So at Hopkins, we try to always start with the case. Very commonly, it's a, if it's a rare disease, it's a very interesting case. Now, when it comes to preventive cardiology, the cases aren't always so interesting. And I think that's the point. In preventive cardiology, we see patients or we get asked about patients that you see every day. And if it's not a patient you see every day, it's a family member or a friend who's asking the exact same question of you. So I think hopefully this is all very relevant. So let's take our case, which we'll come back to a few times through the lecture. It's an asymptomatic patient who's 55 years old, non-smoking, no diabetes, a man of good diet and exercise habits, but has a family history of premature coronary disease in his father. His father had a heart attack in his young 60s. You see him in your clinic, the blood pressure is 139 over 85. The HDL is 60 and the LDL is 145. 
then you calculate his pooled cohort equations risk and it's 6.4%, in other words, squarely in the borderline risk zone in the new guidelines. So not a very interesting case, but hopefully something that you can agree that we see or hear about every day. A 55-year-old man, otherwise pretty healthy, with a family history. Of course, what we'll be talking about today is coronary artery calcium scoring. So the important part to know about calcium scoring is that it can be done on any modern multi-detector CT that has CT has cardiac gating technology installed. So here you see the patients in a gown, but a person can easily be in street clothes as long as they have electrodes to gate to the cardiac cycle. And this test can be done in about 10 minutes of room time, about one millisievert of radiation, which is about a third of background radiation. So it's a fast test. It's a uh, low radiation test. And importantly, you do it the exact same way, no matter where you are in the world as opposed to uh, echocardiography, which could be operator dependent or CT angiography, which is more uh, technology and operator dependent. The calcium score is done the exact same way, no matter where you go. Same energy photon, uh, same slice thickness, and same approach to interpreting the study. And you get images, of course, that look like this. They're unenhanced images of the heart and those things that are bright, that, uh, that highly attenuate the x-rays, are calcium, and all the operator needs to do is figure out if that calcium is within the coronary arteries or not, make sure to exclude things like the sternum or the ribs, circle that calcium, and the software will spit out a calcium score. Simple as that, takes about two minutes to interpret. By design, this is highly reproducible, highly fast, and simple. And that's why it's such a great tool for risk prediction in the outpatient asymptomatic patient setting. And really our understanding of how calcium scoring work dates back to some of the mid nineties work by, uh, by John Rumberger when he was at the Mayo Clinic. That's our shown on the left. So Dr. Rumberger showed that using autopsy specimens, there's a direct relationship between the amount of calcium in your arteries and the amount of plaque on the y-axis. And that's, that is how we should understand the calcium score. It's a test of plaque burden. The more calcium you have in your arteries, the more plaque you have. So we're leveraging the fact that you can see calcium on an unenhanced image to get a sense of plaque burden, because we know that plaque burden is the best predictor of risk. And further, we know that if you go to an asymptomatic population, a community-based screening population like MESA, the Multi-Ethnic Study of Atherosclerosis, we know that certainly while the burden of disease goes up with age, that it's heterogeneous across age groups. If you're young, we, there's patients with advanced disease, and there's also a sizable fraction of patients who live into their 70s or 80s with no detectable disease at all. So it's a test of plaque burden and it's heterogeneous across age. But when you look at the event rates in a community-based study like MESA, they're directly proportional to the burden of disease. If you're young and you have a high calcium score, you have a high risk. And if you're older and have a low calcium score, you're low risk. And this makes sense. So it translates what we would usually call your, the chronologic age of the patient into a biologic age. You're as old as your arteries are. And this notion of calcium scoring being a metric of kind of the biologic age of the patient has been shown in multiple studies. This idea that it's sort of a integrator of risk that really signifies risk for several chronic diseases probably marks the susceptibility of tissues to risk factors. So here in this study, show that patients who have higher calcium scores are also higher risk of cancer, chronic kidney disease, COPD, and dementia. So once again, if you have a high calcium score, probably signifying once again, tissue injury, end organ tissue, tissue injury, you're at risk for a host of chronic diseases. Likewise, if your calcium score is zero, you're actually low risk of a variety of different chronic disease outcomes, and you're one of those healthy agers that are resilient. So you can do some neat things with the calcium score because it's not just a marker of cardiovascular risk. You can model, for example, what a patient is more likely to die from. What we're showing here is age on the x-axis, calcium score on the y-axis, and the line represents the line when the, the risk of dying of cardiovascular disease is equal to that of cancer. So if you're in the red part of this plot, you're more likely to die of cardiovascular disease. If you're blue, you're more likely to die of cancer. So if you're a 55-year-old man with a high calcium score, you're more likely to die of cardiovascular disease. In other words, preventative measures are more likely to, to make you live longer. 
And if you're in the blue part of this plot, you're more likely to die of a non-cardiovascular cause, making certainly preventive cardiology less important for your longevity. And one of the most important things to know about calcium scoring is that when it's absent, when calcium is absent, it's one of the most powerful negative predictors of experiencing a cardiovascular event. So if your calcium score is zero, it's the most powerful marker that you can have for showing resilience to atherosclerosis better than having, for example, no family history or no metabolic syndrome features or a healthy lifestyle even. This is consistent with what we call the imaging hypothesis of risk prediction, that due to its superior sensitivity for the disease, imaging tests for subclinical atherosclerosis are excellent for ruling out or downgrading risk estimates. So the reason why CT and calcium scoring is so important in primary prevention is not only can it find patients at higher risk, most risk factors by their very nature are designed to find people at higher risk. You know, if you have a, a serum biomarker or if you have a genetic uh, polygenic risk score that's high, it marks high risk and the inference is that you need to treat more. But CT also can identify patients who are lower risk than you thought, who you might suspect have atherosclerosis but don't, and gives you the opportunity to be more conservative. So a CT not only, calcium scoring not only finds patients that are higher risk, it can also find patients that are lower risk. It enables us to kind of risk stratify in a, in a true sense of the word more than other risk factors. And we've argued in the past that the calcium score can help to risk stratify patients that would otherwise be eligible for example, for preventative therapy, it might be the most rational way to approach primary prevention, identifying the, the, the likelihood of benefiting from preventive pharmacotherapy, focusing on treating patients with measurable atherosclerosis that are more likely to benefit from our therapies and of course, less likely to be harmed. So this is sort of the uh, concept nowadays of, of, um, of uh, targeted preventative therapy. Can we find the patients that are more likely to benefit and not expose patients who are less likely to benefit to our same preventive strategies? So of course, this is all baked into the new 2018 cholesterol guidelines. This is all stuff that you know in primary prevention if you're age 40 to 75 and don't have super high LDL cholesterol above 190, you start with 10 year risk assessment if the risk is in the borderline or intermediate risk zone and to five to 20% ASCBD risk, you consider things like risk enhancing factors, for example, the family history in our patient. And if the decision to treat the patient is uncertain, you consider a calcium score. So the patient in our vignette had the risk 6.4%, they'd be squarely in this orange group here where you uh, consider other risk enhancing factors in the calcium score to decide on therapy. And here's the way it's written in the guidelines. There's a class 2A recommendation, an intermediate risk or select borderline risk adults. But if the decision about, for example, statin use remains uncertain, it's reasonable to use the calcium score in the decision to withhold, postpone, or initiate statin therapy, right? So you can decide to withhold, postpone, or initiate statin therapy based on the results of a calcium score in those select patients. And there's now a lot of data that suggests that you benefit from preventive therapy in proportion to your burden of disease. Now this sounds sort of obvious, but I think it's important to demonstrate it, that you benefit from preventive therapy in direct proportion to your burden of disease, which makes sense. So on the left, this is data from the St. Francis Heart randomized control trial, the only trial that randomized patients to statins with a baseline calcium score assessment. In the bottom part of this curve, it shows uh, this graph, it shows that if you're calcium score is higher, you get a greater relative risk reduction with statins. Much more importantly, you get a greater absolute redu risk reduction with a statin. And on the right is data from the Walter Reed experience. This is clinical data. This is matching people who received a statin to people that were similar to those patients who didn't receive a statin. And this is calcium scores of zero in the upper left part and calcium scores of about 400 in the bottom right. And you can see there was really no benefit from statins when the calcium score was zero, these patients remained very low risk over 10 years. But as the calcium score increased, there appeared to be a greater relative and absolute risk reduction 
with a statin. This is basically telling us that you benefit from anti-atherosclerotic therapy in proportion to the, the burden of atherosclerosis, which I think makes sense. So that's really a summary of where we are. That's the work that's brought us up to, to 2018 and 19, where the, the guidelines endorse calcium scoring as the only test that receives a two-way recommendation for guiding shared decision-making in primary prevention in patients who are uncertain about whether they want to take preventive therapy. So it's guideline endorsed and ready for prime time, but what's new? So what I want to take the rest of the time in the talk to talk about is what's new. What are the questions that we get from clinicians about how to use this test? and how to take it to the next level and things that hopefully that will guide your practice. So the first thing I wanna talk about in terms of what's new is the use of coronary calcium to guide other preventive therapies rather than statins. So for a long time, the discussion around calcium scoring was around statins. You know, should I treat with a statin or not? And I would say that's sort of old news. I mean, that's a very limited perspective towards risk prediction and primary prevention. Statin use, exact statins are very safe, they're effective. It's a pretty limited question. I wanna go beyond that and talk about how we can use uh, calcium scoring to guide a lot of other decisions in primary prevention too. Because it turns out, of course, risk is along a continuum. There's really no clear separation between primary and secondary prevention. Uh, right, your primary prevention up until the day you have a heart attack and then your secondary prevention. But clearly, there's an intermediate risk group here or intermediate group here that's, that's at higher risk than the average primary prevention patient that's approaching the risk of that of secondary prevention. So what I want to focus this discussion on in this part is the idea of patients with advanced subclinical atherosclerosis as being a distinct risk group. It shouldn't really be considered traditional primary prevention and are not yet secondary prevention, but are their own group that require their own really approach and really are the future of a lot of biopharmaceuticals uh, uh, moving into new populations, right? There's a lot of uh, trials that look at secondary prevention, some trials that have looked at primary prevention, but the new focus will be on patients with advanced subclinical atherosclerosis where we can intervene early and prevent that first event. So the first decision that comes up all the time in primary prevention, should I use an aspirin? Because we know that based on recent clinical trial evidence, aspirins have a much narrower therapeutic window than we ever thought before. You know, three recent clinical trials showed very limited, if no benefit, net benefit with an aspirin primary prevention. And the, and the latest guidelines downgraded aspirin to a 2B recommendation, only in high-risk patients who didn't have high bleeding risk. So the question is, can we use the calcium score to figure out who's more likely to benefit from an aspirin. So what I'm showing here is a plot of number needed to treat and number needed to harm with aspirin. So let me walk you through this here. So along the bottom in the colors, we have uh, different calcium scoring groups. The red line is the number needed to harm with aspirin and the bars represent the number needed to treat based on the calcium score groups. So this is data from MESA. Uh, looking at the, the risk and the bleeding, the risk of events and the, the bleeding risk that's observed over time as a function of the calcium score, and then estimating where the benefit is with aspirin. Now you can see here in the blue, blue is all comers based on their, their risk. And you can see that in, in this plot, all the blue bars are higher than the red line. That suggests that the number needed to treat is higher than the number needed to harm for all groups that you choose based on the pooled cohort equations. And this is why the new guidelines downgraded aspirin use, because you can't use the pooled cohort equations to find a group that has a clear net benefit from aspirin because bleeding risk goes up in proportion to cardiovascular disease risk. So that's the blue bar. But if you look at the green bars here, when the calcium score is high, you can identify a subgroup of patients who have high cardiovascular risk, but no enhanced risk of bleeding. And you can see here when the risk is low or intermediate or even high, when the calcium score is above 100, or certainly when it's above 400, you clearly see that the number needed to treat is lower than the number needed to harm. And likewise, when the calcium score is zero in orange, clearly the number needed to treat is much higher than the number needed to harm. So the first thing I think you can use the calcium score for clinical practice is the decision about aspirin. I would say anyone who has a calcium score of zero absolutely should not be on aspirin in my opinion. I will take them off of aspirin, if the score is zero, you can see you're much more likely to harm patients than you are 
help them when the calcium score is zero. And I will selectively use aspirin only in primary prevention when the calcium score is above 100. And this is what's written in the newest SCCT guidelines, as well as the National Lipid Association guidelines. When the calcium score is above 100, use an aspirin. And when it's lower than that, probably don't, because you're more likely to cause harm. So here's where the calcium score can help you with another decision about how, uh, when to use aspirin in primary prevention and selectively using it just in those patients with advanced subclinical atherosclerosis. Okay, how about blood pressure? So we're always making decisions about blood pressure too, how aggressive to be with our blood pressure goals. And as you know, the new guidelines suggest that if you have a blood pressure between 130 and 139, you're in the stage one hypertension group. And then if you're high risk, you should start preventive pharmacotherapy. And if you're on the lower risk side, you should try lifestyle to try to get that blood pressure down. This paper here showed that, of course, the calcium score helps to risk stratify patients that are in the stage one hypertension group. And then let's ask the question, well, how tight should we be with blood pressure control? And this is data from one of our studies, the Coronary Artery Calcium Consortium. And what this study asked is, can you identify patients using the calcium score that are as high as risk as patients who are enrolled in the SPRINT trial? Of course, the SPRINT trial was a study of about 10,000 patients that were high risk randomized to intensive blood pressure control or more of a standard uh, blood pressure control target. And of course there was a decrease in events when you aimed for intensive uh, blood pressure control in these high-risk patients. So if you then look at the event rate in sprint and then look at the relationship of the calcium score to events, you can identify what calcium score gives you the risk equivalent to that of someone that would have been enrolled in the sprint trial. That's about a calcium score of about 250 or so. Let's call it 300. So when, you're, when your uh, calcium score is about 300, you have the risk equivalent to someone enrolled in the SPRINT trial. And what I do in clinical practice, when I've got patients with high calcium scores, I aim for intensive tight blood pressure control in such patients because they're high risk patients. In other words, once again, treating that patient with advanced subclinical atherosclerosis differently than I would a routine primary prevention patient, maybe that had a calcium score of zero, where lenient, more lenient blood pressure, pressure control might be acceptable. Okay, what about cholesterol? So it always comes up, well, how tightly, how much should I lower the LDL cholesterol? Well, this is just a study here. that has been replicated a couple of times now. It shows that how high risk patients are that have scores above 1,000. If your calcium score is above 1,000, you're very likely to have four vessel disease, including left main, uh, atherosclerosis. You're very likely to have extra coronary disease in your, your aortic valve, your... Uh, uh, aorta, your mitral annulus, et cetera, and you're extremely high risk, even higher risk than patients who have scores, let's say, of 300 or so. We're here showing the CHD mortality and CBD mortality by the calcium score. And when the calcium score is above 1,000, you can see that you have a risk that's equivalent to or exceeds that of the placebo group of the Fourier trial, which was a trial of evolocumab, a PCSK9 inhibitor, and secondary prevention. So you can identify patients that are just as high as risk as those patients you enroll in secondary prevention trials who have advanced subclinical atherosclerosis. And that's shown here from MESA. Again, replicating this, calcium score on the x-axis, the event rate on the y-axis. And this is showing equivalency of risk to patients from the Fourier trial. So calcium score of about 900 in MESA gave you the same risk as someone from the Fourier trial. But in the Fourier trial, there was also lower risk subgroups of patients in secondary prevention, patients who had only one myocardial infarction or only had single vessel disease at the time of their index event. And you can see that calcium scores in the 300 or 600 range give you risk equivalent to those lower risk patients enrolled in the Fourier trial. So once again, I'm trying to paint the picture that you can find patients in primary prevention that are starting to overlap in risk with some of the patients that we traditionally consider secondary prevention. Okay, so what about cardiometabolic drugs? So right nowadays we've had a, a, a boom in our knowledge about drugs like GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGL-2 inhibitors, drugs uh, indicated for diabetes, but also for cardiovascular risk reduction. And the question is just when do we employ them in practice? We all see a lot of patients with diabetes. Well, this is looking at the ESC guidelines. The ESC guidelines say that if you've got a patient with diabetes who has ASCVD, 
or who is high or very high risk of ASCVD and is drug naive, the first drug should be an SGL2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist if that patient is high, very high risk or has ASCVD. And only if that patient isn't in one of those high-risk groups do you go down a more conventional pathway of metformin and other oral therapies. So the question is, can you use the calcium score also to find patients that are high risk in diabetes, high enough risk to start upfront use, for example, of an SGL2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist? And perhaps not surprisingly, the calcium score once again risk stratifies patients with diabetes. And if the orange line here was the, the line that uh, would be of kind of presumed uh, cost effectiveness of, um, let's say, a GLP-1 receptor agonist in clinical practice, patients with high calcium scores are, are, are patients who are much more likely to get uh, cost effective net benefit from the drug. And patients with scores of zero, that's a, not a very good buy, not a very good value and primary prevention to treat such patients who are low risk with kind of more expensive um, uh, therapies. And this is actually in the ESC guidelines. It says the calcium score can be considered a risk modifier for risk assessment in moderate risk asymptomatic patients with diabetes to guide the selection of therapy. And we do this all the time in our cardiometabolic clinics. So we have a cardiometabolic clinic uh, within our uh, prevention center. We get referrals for obesity and diabetes and nearly all those patients will get imaging to assess their risk. And we'll use a high calcium score, for example, as a rationale to start, for example, a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGL-2 inhibitor as the first drug in a patient, for example, that was discharged from the hospital with a new diagnosis of diabetes. Okay, so I've, I've showed you how I think the calcium score is much more than just a decision maker about statins. It helps you decide about other therapies too. So let's come back to our patient. So this was a 55-year-old non-smoking, non-diabetic man with good diet and exercise habits. He's got a family history, blood pressure that's running a little high, and LDL cholesterol that's running a little high. The pooled cohort equations is only limited help here. He's borderline risk. So there's a moderate level of evidence to consider a moderate intensity statin in this scenario. But have we done enough? Have we personalized this therapy at all? So what I'd recommend in this patient, what I would do is I would do a calcium score. And this was a patient for my clinic recently. And the calcium score came out as 325. And that put this person at the 95th percentile of risk. In other words, if you went into the community and scanned hundred patients, only 5% of patients would have higher calcium scores than this gentleman who saw me, probably because of his family history. So then let's consider how would we treat this patient? So let's go through some treatment options. How would we treat this patient? in primary prevention who has that high calcium score. Well, uh, option one is lifestyle therapy only, right? That's a reasonable approach before you did the calcium score because he's borderline risk. The guidelines give you the option of conservative approach. Lifestyle therapy only would be a reasonable option if you didn't know the calcium score in this case. A moderate intensity statin is also a reasonable option. When you're borderline risk, you have a moderate level of evidence for a moderate intensity statin. That's a, that's a reasonable approach in primary prevention. What about high intensity statin and an aspirin? That's a very forward thinking approach, right? He's a high risk patient. He probably would benefit from a high intensity statin and an aspirin. What I'm gonna argue in this talk is I think we can do more. I think we can take a patient like this and say, this patient has advanced subclinical atherosclerosis at an early age, is very high risk. We really wanna do everything we can to mitigate that risk before that patient becomes secondary prevention. So I think for this patient, we would focus not just on standard lifestyle, but intensive lifestyle, which I'll talk about in a second, high intensity statin and an aspirin. His blood pressure was also 139 over 85. This is a patient you might consider a tighter blood pressure control goal in. And also his, his LDL was 145. Maybe with you give a statin, you might get that down into the uh, 80s or 90s. But this might be a patient that you want to consider non-statin add-on therapy to achieve that secondary prevention LDL goal of less than 70 or non-HDL goal of less than 100. So you can see all these options were reasonable before you knew the risk of the patient. But I would argue once you know the calcium score, we have a rationale to be much more personalized with these goals and be aggressive. Be less aggressive when the score is low and be more aggressive when the score is high. So I think this is the future of primary prevention right here.
basing a lot of decisions based on the actual burden of disease of the patient, right? When the calcium score is zero, I think it's a great time to emphasize lifestyle only and be conservative with our therapy. But particularly when you have patients that are about the 90th percentile or above scores of 300, I think that's where you can be aggressive and consider uh, more therapies than just a statin, which I've laid out in the case. And I think when you have a scores above a thousand and you get those referrals for patients that scores above a thousand, that's a rationale to be just as aggressive as secondary prevention, which is what I do in my practice, where I think we can reduce the most events. So that's a summary of kind of where we're headed, I think, in terms of using the calcium score to base further preventive pharmacotherapy decisions. And I can tell you that, that uh, we're now seeing a lot of interest from the pharmaceutical companies in trying to test therapies in this advanced subclinical atherosclerosis population to kind of extend the reach of therapies that we generally think of in secondary prevention to therapies uh, for patients who are high risk primary prevention. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, which I'll go through more quickly. So one of the questions I always get, well, what about calcium scoring in those already on statins? I've heard that the calcium score doesn't work once you've already been exposed to a statin. Well, it is true that once you treat with a statin that you're gonna get some plaque regression. This is a CT angiography study, uh, the paradigm study that showed uh, plaque regression on a statin and you shift that plaque towards a more calcified phenotype with less non-calcified plaque. So it is indeed true that when you give a statin you'll get more calcification. The calcium score will actually go up. It does not go down, it goes up. But importantly, the statin doesn't cause calcium to form if you didn't have plaque in the first place. So we tested, does the calcium score still predict risk in patients that are on statins? And I won't go through this, this data in great detail, but the answer is yes. The calcium score remains an excellent predictor of risk even in patients on statin therapy. So this is very relevant for making decisions about, for example, aspirin or non-statin therapy or blood pressure goals, even when a patient has a history of having um, uh, uh, a non-zero calcium score, or in your patients with statin intolerance who come in and say, I took a statin for a while and now I can't tolerate it anymore, and you're trying to figure out their risk, the calcium score is definitely interpretable in this setting and still very, very useful. And I still routinely get a calcium score in patients who have a history of statin exposure, even you know, I think our guidelines say things like, don't do a calcium score in this scenario because they're only really thinking about the statin question. You can still interpret the calcium score on a patient's on statins. Okay, what about calcium scoring in the young? This comes up a lot. Well, when should I start calcium scoring? So I first wanna uh, let you know, of course, that calcium scoring still is highly prognostic at a young age. Here, these are patients age 30 to 50 from one of our large cohorts. You can see that um, it, the frequency of having a calcium score of zero is high, of course, at young age, but 80% when you're between the age of 30 and 39, and about 70% or so when you're between age of 40 and 49. But conversely, that means to 20 to 30% of people at a young age have detectable calcium. If you look here at uh, mortality rates, even those young patients that have high calcium scores are at increased mortality in the next decade. These are the patients that have those premature events that we seek the most to prevent. So the calcium score has a reasonable yield at a young age and is very prognostic, but we need to remember how best to use it. So this is an interesting study saying that, of course, the more risk factors that you have, the more likely you are to have calcium at a young age. These are 20 to 30 year olds with one risk factor, two risk factor, or three risk factors. The, the, the prevalence of calcium was 10 to 30%, even in 20 to 30 year olds with multiple risk factors. But importantly, what's important to remember is that the, the Atkinson score was just four. The calcium score was just four in such patients. Calcium scores at young ages are very, very low. And that's why it's important to remember that the calcium score is on an exponential scale. The scores go up exponentially over time. So if your score is zero and you become someone with a score of one, and the next year your score will be two, and the next year after that your score will be three, and then it'll be five, and then it'll be eight, and eventually it'll start going up exponentially. And this is the nature of the calcium score and many people don't realize this. And when you realize this, it points to how important the calcium scoring can be at earlier ages. So most people don't realize that the Agatson score, the calcium score is on an exponential scale. But generally speaking, we remain calcium scores of zero for half of your life or longer 
And then it can take 12 to 15 years for you to progress from a calcium score of one to a calcium score of 100, but only a few years to go from a score of 500 to 800. So there's a much bigger difference at the lower range of the calcium scores than there is at the upper range. So let me show you a patient at the 90th percentile. Generally speaking, you progress, your calcium score progresses at your percentile curve in the absence of kind of an intervention. So here's a patient in the 90th percentile. So if you have a patient in your practice that's age 50 with a score of 110 or page at age 60 who scores 450, that patient would have had a score of about 10 at age 40. In other words, would have been clearly detectable with a positive calcium score at age 40, or even probably at about age 35 in this case. Someone who converts to a non-zero score at about age 35 will be on this curve and will have a score of above 1,000 at age 70. You can see the exponential growth in the calcium score, but likewise, the yield is reasonable at the younger ages. And the relationship of the calcium score with events, therefore, is logarithmic. So most of the risk stratification of the calcium score occurs in this lower range between, so let's say, scores of zero and 300 or so. Once you get out here to above 1,000 or 1,500, it doesn't really matter anymore. You're high risk, and there's a relatively flat curve here. If we want to be scanning patients in that lower age range when you can really risk stratify them. So one of the questions that comes up is, what's the optimal age to initiate calcium scoring in patients who have ASCVD risk? And that was this paper that we did in Jack recently, is to show that when you have risk factors, of course, you develop calcium sooner. And at the bottom here, it shows for each risk factor, how much sooner you develop calcium. And if you have combinations of risk factors, how much sooner you develop calcium. And we said, at what age for men and women with a certain risk factor background, would you have a 25% chance of having calcium in your arteries? You can see here, if you have a family history and hyperlipidemia, about 25% of women at age 48 have calcium. Now, 25% of men at age 35 have detectable calcium already. That will be a very low score, but then will progress over time. So in this paper, there's some guidelines for when to consider a first calcium score in a patient who you're think might be at risk. And if you have no risk factors, but maybe other risk enhancing factors, a woman at the age of 58 or man at the age of 42 has about a 25% chance of having calcium. So this is data that can help guide when we think about calcium scoring at young ages. And there's now a tool that will be up online in the next couple of weeks for calculating uh, age, sex, and race-based percentiles for uh, calcium scores at young ages. For those who, you, who do imaging in the audience, you know that the MESA Calculator only allows calculation of percentiles between the ages of 45 and 84, because the age range of MESA will here will be a new calculator between the ages of 30 and 45. And we can see here that this 36 year old male who has a score of eight, you might say, well, that's a low score. That's not so bad. But at 36 years old, a score of eight puts that person well above the 91st percentile. And that's a patient I think we need to be thinking about earlier initiation of preventive pharmacotherapy or other lifestyle measures. Okay, so another topic, what's new? Well, people always ask about, well, what's the warranty period of a calcium score of zero? If you get a calcium score at zero, do you, do you never uh, repeat the scan? Do you consider that patient low risk for life? Or is there some period of time at which you should consider a repeat scan? And that's data that's shown here. This is new data from um, Jack and, and Jack Imaging. Um, at the top here, we see uh, risk of the patient here, low risk, intermediate, or high risk, man or woman. What I'm showing here is in years, how many years it takes for, in this case, one in five patients to convert from a score of zero to a, sc a score that's detectable, or here, a one in four chance, a 25% chance of someone uh, converting from a score of zero to detectable. And this is pretty simple. When you're low risk, it's five to seven years. When you're intermediate risk, it's three to five years and you're high risk, it's three years. So that's what the new Endocrine Society guidelines say. That's what the new National Lipid Association guidelines say. If you're looking to when to repeat a calcium score when the score is zero, it might change your management. It's not every year, every five to seven years if they're low risk, three to five years if they're intermediate risk, and three years if they're high risk. So you don't need to decide for life that a patient's low risk if they had a score of zero. You can track them over time, but not every year. Every, let's say three to five years for your average patient, you're going to scan them again to see if it would change your management. And we know here at the bottom 
the patients who have a score of zero have a very low event rate, let's say over the first five years. Only about 0.7% of patients will have an event in the first five years after a score of zero. And if you rescan them, 72% of patients will have a score of zero and they remain a, a very low event rate, less than 2% over the ensuing 10 years. But if you identify patients who've converted to having a detectable calcium score, that event rate now is threefold higher. And that's a group of patients that you might wanna follow because they've started to develop the earliest signs of atherosclerosis. Okay, so the next part I wanted to move on to was how do we communicate calcium-based risk uh, in the clinic? So for a long time, there was never a tool that allowed you to calculate the 10-year risk of someone based on the results of their calcium score. But now we have such a tool. That's the MESA CHD risk score. That's what's shown here. You can go online and find this tool or there's an app that you can download to calculate it. Basically, you can put in the risk factors of the patient and the calcium score and figure out how that's changed their coronary risk. And that's shown here. You can see here on a patient on the left who's got a, a, a multiple risk factors, but a calcium score of zero. On the right, a patient with a high calcium score, but no risk factors. You can see how that risk changes uh, once you incorporate the calcium score into the calculation. For example, this patient on the left, the second sentence says, if we ignored the calcium score, the patient didn't have a calcium score, this patient's risk would be 15%. But now that we know that patient has a calcium score of zero, they're actually more like about a 4% risk. So this is a tool that helps you figure out how to modify someone's risk uh, based on the calcium score. I mentioned you can download an app for this. I think it's very helpful sometimes to show patients why we're making a decision based on their, their score results. And we can come back to our patient here, a 55-year-old man I mentioned, that it was sort of otherwise borderline risk, who had the high calcium score. This patient's risk would be 2% if they had a calcium score of zero. But knowing the patient had a calcium score of 325, this patient's risk is more like 13%. So we're able to, once again, risk stratify this patient. This patient, when you see them, they could have been a lower patient, they could have been a high-risk patient. We don't know until we check their burden of disease. And a new tool that will be up on the MESA website soon is the so-called coronary age calculator, where you can take this patient, not only get their risk, but you can calculate kind of what their coronary age would be. This is the age at which an otherwise healthy person would have the same risk as our patient. So this uh, patient in our vignette, if they had a calcium score of zero, their actual their coronary age would be 42. Even though they're a 55-year-old patient, we can tell them we can communicate risk and that you actually have the risk of a healthy 42-year-old. But in contrast, if the calcium score is 300, this patient actually has the arteries, the coronary risk of a 77-year-old. This is a way to translate this risk into a way that's easy to communicate with patients. You know, because of your burden of disease, you have the risk of a 77-year-old. That's why we're going to treat you aggressively. And there'll be a new MESA ASCBD risk tool, score tool and a cardiovascular age calculator uh, coming out later this year. So to kind of provide people a, a, a suite of tools to try to calculate risk and communicate risk with their patients in primary prevention. Okay, a topic I wanna to cover is where we're headed, which is not only doing calcium scoring from dedicated cardiac gated cardiac CT, a calcium score dedicated cardiac scan, but also interpreting calcium from non-gated chest CT, right? Tons of patients get chest CTs every year because of COVID or because of lung cancer screening, et cetera. And it turns out that there's a lot of information on those scans that we tend to ignore clinically. There's now a class one recommendation from the SCCT and the STR, Society of Thoracic Radiology, to report at least a visual estimation of calcium on all chest CTs. And this is increasingly being done around the country because it's cardiovascular information that we tend to ignore from these non-gated scans. And there's now a risk score out to translate the results from the visual interpreted um, uh, scan to a, our traditional Agatson score. And this is called CAC-DRS, the CAC Data and Reporting System. And it's very simple. CAC-DRS is a score of zero, one, two, or three. Score of zero is when you don't have any calcium. One, mild calcium. Two, moderate calcium. Three, severe calcium. And it's meant to map on traditional calcium scores of zero, one to 100, 100 to 300, or greater than 300. 
is we know that experienced readers can look at a chest CT and say, that's about a score of 200, that's about a score of 400, and put patients into general categories. And actually within the CAC DRS scoring system, not only can you uh, estimate the amount of calcium, but if you add in how many vessels are afflicted, just a simple counting, you have moderate calcium in three vessels. You can predict risk almost as well as with, with the traditional Agassiz score. So just a visual estimation from chest CT that you have moderate calcium in three vessels, for example, puts you on a risk continuum without even having to do a formal calcium score. So I encourage all the fellows out there, or anyone seeing patients, I mean, many of your patients have had a former chest CT, just to open up that chest CT and look at it. Don't need a formal score. You can't do a formal score on an ungated study, but you can get us an assessment of how much disease they have. And, and, and do an incredible job of risk stratifying them just with this free information incidentally noted on a chest CT. So I wanted to point out to the listeners who are interested in these topics that the 2021 National Lipid Association guidelines on calcium scoring were really outstanding, I think. Um, they, they have a great infographic that summarizes all the kind of the need to know points about calcium scoring. I think I've covered many of them here. Uh, when to do calcium scoring, how to consider it in terms of age, sex, and race what to do when the calcium score is above 100 and aspirin, intensive lipid lowering when the score is above 300 or 1,000. Something I won't talk about today is calcium scoring when patients have familial hypercholesterolemia, which is an emerging um, uh, way of using the tool for figuring out who's gonna benefit most from our most advanced therapies. And in the NLA guidelines, they publish this nice algorithm that you can walk through. For example, our patient would have been in this green group, uh, otherwise, uh, a not high risk patient. We did a calcium score and it was above 300. And it says favor adding a statin to lower the LDL, an add on therapy to get the LDL less than 70, an aspirin and a blood pressure goal of less than 120, as long as high bleeding risk is not present. So this can walk you through a very simple algorithm of how to treat a patient in primary prevention. Okay, so let's get close to closing that with the, the last uh, key new topic I wanted to cover and that's calcium scoring in chest pain. Because we know that patients that have calcium scores of zero are extremely unlikely to have obstructive coronary disease or to have an event in the ensuing one to two or three years. So this is data coming from the emergency room, 5,000 patients that come to the emergency room. Many patients that come to the emergency room with chest pain actually end up being low risk. 56% of those patients had a calcium score of zero. They're following up those patients. One in one in 20 of those patients had any plaque at all. Less than one in 100 of those had obstructive coronary disease and less than one in 200 of those patients needed a revascularization in the, in the near term. In other words, the calcium score of zero had a 99.3% negative predictive value. You have to scan 264 patients um, or treat 264 patients who have a negative scan to find one patient who might get a near term benefit on a non-fatal outcome. And that's why the new chest pain guidelines say, if you have a patient who has stable chest pain, in other words, they don't have elevated cardiac biomarkers, they don't have a, a acutely injurious EKG, and they don't have known CAD, it's reasonable. There's a two-way recommendation to do a calcium score in that setting to modify your pretest probability, right? You started with a low-risk patient, uh, low-risk chest pain scenario, it's a two-way recommendation for both a calcium scoring or an exercise stress test to risk stratify that patient further. Especially when the score is zero, you can stop your evaluation there. Particularly useful in the outpatient setting when you've got uh, chest pain syndromes, they're trying to evaluate the kind of the dual role of uh, evaluating the chest pain as well as risk stratifying the patient. And if the score is high, then you move on to a consideration, for example, of other tests if that chest pain is persistent. Quick remark about cost effectiveness and reimbursement. We need to make the calcium score wider available because it has so much benefit, particularly for patients who haven't engaged as much with the healthcare system who don't know their risk. I'll just say that there's multiple studies now showing that the calcium score is a cost effective test when it's priced below $150. At our center, we do it for out of pocket for $75, for example. But a very innovative study from Cleveland showed that if you offer this test for free, what happens? Well, you get more women to get the score done, you get more African-Americans to get the score done, and you get more lower income Americans to get the score done. So if we make this test cheaper and more widely accessible, we can broaden the net, particularly for underrepresented folks, 
who could benefit from advanced risk stratification. I won't have time to talk about clinical trials in the calcium score space much today, but I'll say that it was an NHD uh, LBI workshop uh, thinking about how can we raise the level of evidence for calcium scoring even higher. There are some interesting ideas for using the calcium score in innovative clinical trial designs. Right now, the core cow trial is ongoing in, in the Intermountain system. You might have read a recent report, uh, preliminary report that showed that the calcium score helps to um, get high risk patients on therapy, uh, have get low risk patients on more conservative approaches and lower their risk factors. So the long term follow up of the core cow is now ongoing. And we're doing a big study in the elderly population uh, within the preventable trial, 20,000 patients randomized to a torvastatin or placebo above the age of 75, looking at a variety of important outcomes to older individuals. Half of those patients will get a calcium score at baseline to try to figure out if that helps determine who gets a benefit at older age from calcium scoring or from statins as well. Now, so one thing I won't cover today, it's almost a separate imaging talk. Glad to talk to the imaging group about this, but there's actually a lot you can prove about the calcium score too. So these are two patients that both have a calcium score of 200 here, but they're actually very, very different. And I've listed here the metrics on how they're different. This patient on the left has just calcium in the LAD. This patient on the right has calcium dispersed throughout the coronary tree. This person on the right has much more plaque burden, has much more high risk plaque, and is a higher risk patient, even though they have the same calcium score as the patient on the left. So we can improve the calcium score actually using innovative uh, strategies beyond just a traditional Agatson score as well. Okay, so let me conclude and hopefully take a few questions, particularly clinical questions about using the calcium score. And I'll, I'll summarize as this. I think the calcium score is now guideline endorsed and ready for prime time use. And what do I mean by prime time use? I mean routine use in patients who need further risk stratification. And importantly, it's not just for statins. If we keep on talking about calcium scoring just for statins, we're missing a lot of the potential benefit of risk stratification and, per, and primary prevention. It can guide all your preventive therapy decisions from aspirin to blood pressure, to LDL goals, to new therapies that are coming down the pipeline. And we need universal calcium scoring coverage, hopefully by insurers. And we need cheap calcium score testing available to even people who are, who are uninsured. And emerging indications for calcium scoring are also using the score in patients on statins if it might change your management. Younger patients who might have risk factors who you want to identify disease earlier rather than waiting if you're identifying patients in your practice when their scores are 1,000. We've missed about 25 years of calcium progression that we could have identified earlier. We now know how to repeat the test when the score is zero, initially zero to follow that patient over time as needed. And we know now that we can interpret calcium on non-gated chest CTs to get just as much risk information that we get from a typical dedicated cardiac gated CT. And now there's a new role for calcium scoring in low risk chest pain, a low cost, easy to use approach to try to, to find patients who don't need advanced workups. Uh, and you might be able to stop at an initial calcium score. Now there's several ongoing event-driven randomized control trials that hopefully will raise the level of evidence in the next decade for calcium scoring. So thank you for having me. And hopefully you've learned something about calcium scoring that's relevant to your practice. And Eric, I'd be glad to take any questions. Terrific. Thank you. That was a, just a fantastic talk. And um, I love how you brought in the scope of uh, thinking about preventative therapy beyond statins, um, especially now that we have so many tools in our kit to lower risk. Right. Um, one of the first questions that comes up and is a question that I also wanted to kind of expand on is, when do we, when is the calcium score insufficient? And when do you think we need to look for a non-calcified plaque? Uh, Dr. Brian Malm asks in the acute setting with chest pain evaluation, and maybe just to expand on that, um, I treat a lot of women, young women with um, family history. Um, and, you know, can we rely on, you showed some data on the younger ages, but is that sufficient in a person who potentially yeah. either has FAH or high family history? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, this is tricky. I mean, uh, in my opinion, there's no phenotype out there that, that makes exclusively non-calcified plaque. There's really no evidence out there that, for example, that the calcium score isn't reflective of your plaque burden, if, even if your LDL is high, for example. But yeah, there's scenarios, especially early in the development of the disease, where you have purely non-calcified plaque, usually low burden, 
but it's possible. So um, I think, you know, especially as we can do CTA for, for lower radiation or cheaper in the future, maybe there'll be an application in family history or FH, uh, for example. Uh, sure. I think uh, it's always reasonable to, to try to look even earlier. Uh, but the calcium score, it is at a sweet spot, you know, very unlikely to have advanced plaque if you've got a score of zero. So there's that a sweet spot where you can identify clinically relevant burden of disease fairly well at the calcium score. But yeah, I think the CTA is reasonable in maybe a couple scenarios, you know, uh, maybe for example, FH, uh, very strong family history. We do those cases sometimes. I, I'm a CT angiographer as well. And then, you know, chest pain is tricky, right? Um, you know, if you, certainly if you've got recurrent chest pain, despite scores of zero, CTA is reasonable. We picked you know, the other day, we had a left main dissection that we picked up in a young woman. So, you know, there's going to be cases out there, usually that are non atherosclerotic. I, I would say that you're not going to find a lot of uh, obstructive non calcified disease. It's possible. But for those other non atherosclerotic causes, sometimes, of course, we need to look further. But in, after an initial evaluation with the calcium score, if, the, if they've got a persistent chest pain syndrome, yeah, I would move on obviously to a CT angiogram in that case. Great, maybe I'll um, ask these next set of questions around invasive yes. angiography. So we have the high calcium score, you know, what is the next step? Is it a, um, is, it a is it a physiologic test, a functional test? Is it a cardiac catheterization? Where do you yeah. go from there? So let me make a strong case in my opinion that when you have a very high calcium score, if you're asymptomatic, you should do nothing except primary, except prevention. I mean, once again, I'm talking about a truly asymptomatic patient. In fact, there's a class three recommendation in the National Lipid Association guidelines to do any follow-up testing in an asymptomatic patient after a calcium score. We should resist that urge, particularly in the post-courage, post-ischemia era, to go looking for ischemia, for example, in an asymptomatic patient. Now, it's a different story if you've got a symptomatic patient, right? So all my patients with high calcium scores, I really dive down deep on whether they have symptoms or not. If they're truly asymptomatic, they're on, they're on the treadmill two hours a day. I don't do anything, but but no matter how high their score is, except for, for preventive therapy. Now, if you go and talk to them and say, well, yeah, I do have some chest pain from time to time. I get short of breath more than I used to. Yeah, I think the next test is a functional test. It's particularly if the score is high. The CT angiogram is going to be less interpretable. I wouldn't necessarily send them straight to the cath lab. The symptoms still might not be ischemic. I would probably send them for a functional test, but I would be relatively conservative. I do not want to get the message that all patients with high calcium scores need a follow-up test. A, a minority of them do based on symptoms in the modern era. I, I think that's an important message. Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Bender, do you want to ask your question? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, Michael, that was just incredibly clear and comprehensive. The most clear and comprehensive coronary calcium uh, talk. I've heard no offense to anyone in our group here who was given one. Um, so you did mention chest CTs where coronary calcium is seen. There are patients who come through who have no coronary risks, identifiable coronary risks. Uh, maybe they go to the Princeton Longevity Center or whatever. They, they end up having coronary calcium evaluation and it's, and it's uh, not insignificant. Their score is not insignificant. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, it, it forces us to think a little bit more about truly non-traditional groups of patients who have coronary disease. And I wonder the one emerging area right now is obviously is clonal hematopoiesis. Yeah. And I wonder um, if you can mention anything about accumulating data uh, correlating uh, coronary calcium scores and CHIP. Well, that's a great question. First of all, the, the first observation you made is important is that what we learned, one of the things we learned from MESA, the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, is that we just can't predict that well who's going to have coronary calcium. I mean, I wish we could say it's only patients with risk factors or only patients with a family history. But in Mesa, there's a lot of patients with no family history and no risk factors who had a high calcium score. So you might ask, well, there were, at the outset of Mesa, there was the idea, well, maybe that's not atherosclerosis then. Maybe they have something else, some other reason to calcify, but they have event rates just as high as other people with high calcium scores. So you need to take a high calcium score seriously, even if the patient doesn't have risk factors. I wish it wasn't the case, but it's the case they have atherosclerosis. Likewise, patients have multiple risk factors and no atherosclerosis. I wish we understood that better too, right? We need to understand the susceptibility, but also the, the uh, resilience factors too. Why can you have risk factors your whole life and high cholesterol and no atherosclerosis? It's, it's fascinating, but, but you're right. There's patients in particular 
that are just missed with traditional risk uh, scoring who are high risk, who are more likely to have calcium. I don't, I don't know a lot of the data on CHIP yet. I mean, I, I would imagine that the mechanism there is atherosclerosis, and I think we need more data there. But certainly patients with high polygenic risk scores are more likely to have calcium. There's some great data on that. Patients with inflammatory diseases, of course. Uh, HIV has been well demonstrated, uh, well demonstrated in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, um, are, are some of the ones that stand out to me the most. Uh, so, so those are patients we routinely calcium do calcium scoring. And of course, patients with kind of metabolic syndrome features that don't really have as much uh, of the traditional risk, all I think benefit from calcium scoring. And we need a lot more data on this. We need a lot more data to kind of shift the model away from just purely relying on the traditional risk factors in these patients that have emerging risk factors like CHIP, other genetic factors, et cetera. It, it's, it's a really awesome area. And I also wanna know why people are protected from atherosclerosis in some cases yeah. too. I don't think we understand that well at all. Yeah, thank you. Terrific. I realize we're at the top of the hour. Maybe we could just do one more question that's in the chat um, around prediabetes and the spectrum of risk within that group and how does calcium scores play a role? Yeah, I love it in the prediabetes area. So I think we're, we're, we're about to see a big revolution in the treatment of obesity and the treatment of metabolic risk, right? Um, I, I'm a huge S, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist advocate in my cardiometabolic clinic. We use it a lot. And as you may know, I'm getting a segue a little bit here, but as you may know, there's a trial ongoing right now in patients who are obese that have cardiovascular disease, but aren't diabetic. And they're treating with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. As you know, you can get 16% weight loss in this setting. Uh, and it's very likely, I think you're going to see a cardiovascular benefit. So I think that's going to shift all of our thinking towards that we can treat obesity or pre-diabetes in a way similar to we, we metabolically, we treat diabetes. So I think that this is a, a very important area, obesity, metabolic syndrome, those patients that are obese and have metabolic syndrome that are high risk that we would have said before, well, you, you don't have diabetes yet. You're really not a candidate for, let's say, weight loss therapy or, or, uh, or some other approach. I think we're going to see a, a change there. So I think uh, in the cardiometabolic clinic that we have now, we routinely, uh, in patients that say that are obese that have prediabetes, we'll do a calcium score on them because they're not all categorically high risk and you can find those patients that are particularly high risk and treat them more aggressively. So I, I love that indication. Terrific. Thank you so much for spending your morning with us. I'm sure we could pick your brain forever on this call, but um, I want to be respectful yeah. of the time. Glad to take any questions that they come up later. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk. It's great. Thank you, Erica. Absolutely. Okay. Hope to see you at ACC. Take care.